how to choose the right strategy. This is another question. If you've been watching the video so far, you'll get the pattern. It seems to be filled with contradictions, doesn't it, right? If you asked 100 strategy gurus and hey, how do you pick the right strategy? Well, from the Lean Startup Camp, you'd hear this. Don't set your strategy. Instead, you go and you interview your customers and you sell them what they want and then you build it. That's the secret to a successful strategy. And then you could go to another camp that say, no, no, that's not it. If Henry Ford asked his customers what they wanted, they would have requested faster horses. So instead, you need to tap into true innovation and disrupt the status quo by delivering to customers what they couldn't even imagine. And you'll hear advice, well, you got to find the blue ocean. And you might then ask, well, how do you do that? You know, so there's all this seeming contradiction. And what I'm going to do in this video is teach you what strategy really is and how to use a strategy map to identify where you are now and then what your next set of moves need to be. So let's get started. The goal of any strategy, as I explained in the first video, is to get energy from the surrounding environment. So energy for a business is any source of usable power. Money is certainly a form of energy. Also resources, people, technologies, capabilities, and market clout, right? You're standing out there in the marketplace. The more energy you can attract now and over time, the higher your probability of success. Now, the trick here is that the environment is always shifting. So your strategy always needs to be evolving, keep in integration with the environment. Now, a way to conceptualize how to do that is to think of three life cycles. I call it the strategy pyramid. And one life cycle is called the product life cycle. That's the assets that you make available for sale. These are the products and services and things that you deliver to customers. There's the market life cycle, which represents the type of customer that you're selling to. And there's also the execution life cycle. The execution life cycle is your organization's ability to develop new capabilities over time. Now, all three of these life cycles need to be in alignment in order for there to be an effective strategy. How that looks when they are aligned is something like this. I call it a strategy map. And what you'll see on the top row is the product life cycle, starting with pilot it, nail it, scale it, milk it or at any time kill it. The bottom of the map, you'll see the type of customers you're selling to. That's the market life cycle. You'll see innovators, early adopters, early majority and late majority laggards. And in the middle of the strategy map, you'll see the execution life cycle. That's your organization's capabilities to execute. And what you'll notice is PSIU is at each stage of the execution life cycle and each stage needs a dominant force. So when you're piloting your product for innovators, you want the surrounding business unit to have a high innovating force. It means that it's adaptive, creative, trying to disrupt the status quo. And when you shift into nailing your product offering for early adopter customers, the producing force comes on really strong. That's that force that focuses on meeting customer needs, works fast, works hard, gets it done, a lot of pressure to be successful. And as you move up the nail it stage and you're in late nail it stage, the stabilizing force needs to get married up with that producing force so that you're systematizing how you sell, service, and deliver. And as you do that, you're able to, this is that classic chasm and crossing the chasm, you're able to leap across the chasm and start to scale your product for the early majority type of customers. And from here, because you have married the stabilizing producing force together, you're, you're producing results for customers, you're doing it efficiently, you now have a platform that you can start to innovate once again and develop new products and services that will go through their own life cycle curve like this, to a place of growth and maturity where you're producing results for customers, you're doing it efficiently, and now you can be innovative again, which means you'll launch new business units that will in turn go through their own life cycle stages. Now I want you to notice on the strategy map that there's always this dynamic between development and stability. And that's true in every system. There's this dynamic and early in the life cycle, there's a lot of flexibility. It needs to be very creative and adaptive. And as that organization grows, things get more stable. So you never want to treat your strategy the same throughout the life cycle. You always treat things differently at different life cycle stages. I'm going to show you the same strategy map with a different lens, and you can use this lens to tell if you're doing strategy correctly. The first thing I want you to notice is down in the lower left hand quadrant, you'll see that's where you're piloting your product for innovators. So it's very important that you're piloting a product for an innovator type of customer. Now, an innovator type of customer will see the world the same way you do. They'll be very 
creative and disruptive and visionary in their own thinking. Their horizon is far out there and they're interested in the latest and greatest trends. So you want to collaborate with innovators when you're piloting your product so that you can help establish thought leadership. If you're establishing thought leadership for innovators, what you should see is that the market growth rate is low for what you're trying to accomplish. The reason that it's low is if you're being truly innovative and disruptive, the rest of the world wouldn't have, have figured it out yet. They're not seeing the world and the problem that you're trying to solve in the same way that you are. I want you to also notice that the competition for what you're doing should be few. Competition, by the way, the definition is perceived practical alternatives. If you're doing this right, it should seem like what you're doing is totally crazy or stupid. Uh, right now we're in a big mobile boom, but 10 years ago, the first mobile company started and people thought they were crazy. What? You know, there weren't smartphones. People weren't doing things on their phones. So those early innovators were out there really pushing the envelope well before it was reported in Wired Magazine or Fast Company. So you really want to be on the bleeding edge here and you want to be working with innovator customers because it's those type of customers who sense what's happening in the future. I want you to notice that it's very expensive to be piloting a product for innovators. It costs a lot of money It's because there's low market growth rate. You haven't figured out the product market fit. Who wants to pay for that? Right? No one. Naturally, the pricing pressure for a business at that stage is very high too. That pricing pressure is high means you can't charge a lot because again, you haven't solved the core customer problem. If you're doing it right, you're showing thought leadership here for innovators. And then you figure out what you're trying to accomplish and you start to work with a different kind of customer. It's an early adopter. Now, an early adopter is very different than an innovator style of customer. An early adopter has got a pain point and they want it solved now, like yesterday. They don't care if you're from a Fortune 500 firm or if your solution is proven. They're willing to work with you as long as you have an aspirin for their pain. Now, if you've done this right, what happened, remember at the last stage is you show a lot of thought leadership, you're piloting it for innovators, you figure out you're onto something, you start to nail it now, start to solve the core customer pain for early adopter kind of customers. Now, based on your efforts, what should be happening is the market growth rate starts to increase because you've shown thought leadership in the prior stage and now you're proving with unarguable evidence that you're solving that core customer pain. Other customers who share that pain will start to give you attention because you're demonstrating unarguably that you solve that pain point. People are talking about you. They're referencing you. What you're doing is interesting. It seems compelling. Now, if you're doing this right, there should still be few competitors for how you're doing things. But because you've shown thought leadership and because you're proving that you solve the core customer pain, the pricing pressure for your business should lessen. You can now charge more for your product or service because You've shown that you solved the pain and because you have established thought leadership. But notice that you're still in negative net cash flow. Let's be honest here. It's very expensive to start a new innovation and get it into nail it stage. That's why you need external sources of financing, either from uh, friends and family or angel investors or VCs or cash flow profits from a, a later stage business unit. Now, you've shown thought leadership piloted it for innovators, you're nailing it for the early adopters, you have unarguable proof that you've solved it, you're building out your team, your structure, your business model. Now is the time to start to leap across the chasm and scale it for the early majority. Now what's happening here, I want you to notice is that you're finally in positive cash flow. It's because you've systematized how you sell, service, and deliver. You've proven you've solved the core customer pain. People are willing to pay for a full solution. And because you've shown thought leadership, and have the evidence that you've nailed it, they're willing to pay you. Now, lots of competitors will start to show up from out of the woodwork, and that's okay. Because you've done this sequence right, your margin should actually start to increase, right? Your pricing pressure for you even backs off even more because you have the benefits of scale. So now there's lots of competitors, the market growth rate is booming, pricing pressure for you is low, and you are making money finally from this business unit. It's generating positive returns. Now, from here, you what you wanna do is start to launch new business units that will go through their own life cycle stages. And what you're trying to prevent is entering into this final stage where you're milking it for late majority laggards. So late majority laggard clients are those kind of clients who are always late to the table. They're not innovative. They buy when things are a commodity. So what's happened is the market growth rate has slowed down tremendously because the problem has been solved. There's not a lot of innovation happening in this space. There's lots of Me Too competitors. You're in a commodity space and the pricing pressure has now shifted to really high. 
right? So margins are much lower than they were. But if you've done the sequence right uh, from piling it for innovators, nailing it for early adopters, scaling it for the early majority, even if you're milking it now for late majority laggards, it can still be a very lucrative, profitable business unit. So that's how you tell you're doing strategy right. There's some telltale indicators, market growth rate, competition, pricing pressure, and net cash flow. I want you to notice that we went the long way around, right? We started from piling it for innovators, then we nailed it for the early adopters, we scaled it for the early majority, and we tried to stay out of milking it for the late majority laggards for as long as possible. And if you do this sequence right, this I call it the long way around or the path to prosperity, what happens is you're creating the maximum building of market awareness. You're making smart, timely investments relative to market and customer timing. You're maintaining your pricing and margins and product focus and thought leadership at the right stages, and you're avoiding this commodity trap in stage four. But there are some classic follies that befall many organizations when they're trying to do strategy the right way. And the first is an error right out of the gate where you're trying to pilot a product into a commodity market. It's called the face plant. And what happens here is you're trying to solve a problem that nobody cares about, or they're not aware that they should care about it. You never establish margins. You never establish thought leadership. And what happens is you go up against well-entrenched vendors who have a complete service offering and you just get crushed, right? You never get any momentum trying to pilot a product into a commodity market. You can pilot a product into a commodity market, but you have to first show thought leadership of why, why your approach is different and then take the time to nail it for early adopters and then go into scale, not go directly into uh, piloting it into a commodity market. The next folly is called the flame out. And what happens here is a, a very visionary, charismatic entrepreneur tells a compelling story or they secure a lot of financing or maybe they've um, secured financing from selling their last company and their vision is so clear to themselves that they build every feature and function under the sun. They go for a global release right out of the, right out of the gate and they try to scale it too early. So they, they don't take the time to really nail it and really understand the core customer pain, their spending priorities, and they don't have the evidence that they really nailed it. So they, they presuppose demand, they do a big launch, lots of noise, lots of excitement, and poof, right? It doesn't hold up over time. You might see this a lot in a software as a service business where the entrepreneur confuses free trial signups with actual success, actually, that they've actually nailed it because, because users are signing up for free. The only evidence you have that you've nailed the product offering is that customers buy it and then they come back and they buy it again. So they buy it once and then they buy new seats or they extend the contract or they make a repeat person. Purchase. Now, if your business isn't selling directly to consumers, but there's an ad advertising supporting model, what you'd want to see is that consumers are using the product more, right? They're spending more time and more engagement with your product and that advertisers are willing to buy and come back and buy more. So you want to avoid the flame out. You want to pilot it for innovators and then make the time and investment to really nail it for early adopters. And part of nailing it for early adopters is not only having unarguable evidence, that you've solved the core customer problem. It's building out your team, your structure, your management system so that you have the capacity to scale. And there's, there's a final folly. It's called the lost opportunity. What happens here is the entrepreneur does do it right where they first pilot it for innovators and they're, they're nailing it for early adopters, but they just can't execute quickly enough. Maybe there's a lot of entropy. There's fighting between the VCs and the founders or between the co-founders, or they just can't capture the opportunity because there's too much inertia or friction in the business and they lose the opportunity, right? They, could, they can't go around the horn fast enough. And this is sad, uh, but it happens a lot. And often you'll see what happens is rather than just killing the business unit and trying again uh, and pivoting, they'll, they'll end up being kind of a low cost provider. The passion's gone, the innovation's gone, the heart of the organization's gone, but it's kind of like fruit dying on the vine. It's a lost opportunity. Well, as you're going the long way around the curve, it can be helpful sometimes to conceptualize where your sources of financing will come from. So remember, when your business unit is on the left side of this chart, you're a negative net cash flow. You need some external source of financing. Uh, when you're piloting for innovators for the first time, typically that financing comes from yourself or friends or family, right? They don't really fully understand what you're trying to do, but they trust you and they're willing to make a bet on you. Uh, as you're showing a lot of thought leadership and starting to nail it for early adopters, typically this is where an angel investor would start to step in and they'll say, hey, we'll fund you to help you build out your prototype and 
really get the evidence that you've nailed it. And then we'll make introductions to VCs who specialize in taking a product that kind of has evidence that they've really nailed it already, typically. And now you need you, your business needs the team, the introductions, the structure, the liquidity to start to really aggressively move into scale mode. And once you've hit early scale mode, you'll typically get the interest of corporate investors who want to fill out their own uh, product market uh, suite. Sometimes corporate investors will invest early, earlier down here, and that's really in nail it stage. It's really an R&D purchase. But if you can leap across the chasm and start to put fear into them that you're going to come and eat their lunch with your fully baked solution offering and getting lots of market demand, they'll try to take you out then to eliminate a future competitor and again, add to their own product market solution. And then private equity typically plays down in between late scale it to commodity zone where it's all about you know financial factoring and things like that. Now this isn't always true, but this is a general representation. Financiers compete in a in a, a market too where there's scarce opportunity and finite energy. So if they're having a hard time in their core offering, you might see a private equity firm acting more like a VC or a VC acting more like an angel. But typically this is the map to know what what type of financing you should be after at different stages. And then I also want to talk to customer-driven agile development. So the Lean Startup and the Four Steps to the Epiphany group, it's all about sell it first, meet with your customers, understand their needs. They're trying to do is get you up to late nail it as fast and as cost effectively as possible with little wasted time, energy, effort, money, right? Quickly get from pilot it for innovators into late nail it stage. Now, just to be clear though, that's not the only way to get around the curve. Right? Steve Jobs probably never did a focus group in his life. He just had this practiced intuitive sense of what customers really wanted and would build it for them. But the important thing is you got to go the long way around the curve, first piloting it for innovators, nailing it for early adopters, then scale it for early majority. It doesn't matter how you do it, just that you do it. Now, I haven't talked about some basics, but it should be self-evident that in order to, to execute on a successful strategy, you've got to have one that aligns with your core vision and values, right? That you're passionate about it, and that aligns with your values. You have to have or get the resources. That means the capabilities to execute on the chosen strategy. And it has to be within your core competence as well. After those three basic requirements are in alignment, then everything else about this strategy map holds true. And so how you figure out what your strategy should be is you first ask, okay, where am I now? It's a lot like, let's say you're in Los Angeles and you want to go to New York. Well, you first thing you do is you pull out a map and say, okay, I might want to be in New York, but I'm in Los Angeles. What's the first move I need to make? And then you take a step in that direction. Strategy is the same thing. It starts with where are you now? And it's really easy. You just line your business unit up on the map where it is and you start with the product stage. So let's say that you have a product in early nail it stage right here. You'd want to check that you are in fact producing results for customers. You want to recognize that, yes, this is going to take a lot of time and effort to really nail this product offering and get the unarguable evidence that we're solving the core customer pain. By the way, if the blue line here is the execution life cycle. So if I draw your business unit off of the blue line, it means that there's some entropy in the system. And if you remember the first video, the lower entropy, which means you need to figure out ways to reduce internal friction, get alignment, make it easier to have your full capabilities at your disposal. Once the entropy is lowered, that means you go up, then you go to the next life cycle stage, right? So you know that your next stage is to go into late nail it where you're systematizing how you sell service and deliver. You might have a business unit over here in Melkit stage and say, okay, that's where we're at. We have this business unit in Melkit stage. What are we going to do? Well, maybe we're going to pilot a new business unit for innovator customers where we're going to show a lot of thought leadership. And once we've established thought leadership and we have a sense of the product market fit, we're going to nail it. We're going to prove it that we have found the product market fit. And so you move up the next stage of the life cycle curve. Or you might say, you know what? We have this business over in Melkit stage, but there's really some innovation opportunity here. We really want to reinvigorate this business unit and move back up the curve and get back into scale up mode. So infinite number of possibilities, but it always starts with where are you now? And then the question is, what should our next move be? That's strategy.